Um, what I'd like to share with you today, uh, as the faith-based liaison with the city, we have this amazing event coming up. Um, it's uh, going to be, what, on Compassion on a national level. Uh, the date and time are there. It's at the end of January. And it's going to be held at the Little Carver, and there's the address. You can, you can contact me there about that information. But Ben O'Dell, who's the faith liaison for the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, will be presenting and facilitating the next Compassion and Action Lab. He's going to be bringing research and models that are working across the country on all the different areas that we are concerned about. Uh, it's free and open to the public. I encourage you to bring a team from your congregation to the organization. Does that make sense? Okay. But, so if you want any of the information there, like this is something I'm interested in, it's, it's there for you to write down and take with you. But then we will also collect these cards, this is the thought, at the end, and we have a possible way that that might be filtered out, but that's another full conversation. Am I making sense? So the last thing I'm going to say to this, we're going to, we're going to actually do that in a little bit, the 30 minutes. But at the end, when we do like our breakouts and networking and things like that, if there are some people who are very, who, uh, I don't even know if I want to say very much interested in this, but there are people who want to have a conversation about how it went and how we can fine tune that, we'll be meeting over here by the piano. Okay? Will that be in conflict with the other? It'll be at the same time. But we'll just be working out kind of logistical <coughs> details. How do we think that went? There's another form that we have that we could possibly use. So we're just going to explore that. Okay? Yes, ma'am. I don't understand. Um, so we want to know that. We want to we want to write it down. But if, if we can't write it down where we're sitting, will it be available to us? We haven't figured that part out yet. Okay. But it's now available to you to write down. And you have a pen, huh? I have pens. <laughs> I brought a bag. A pants. Yes. Another question. So maybe like our list of addresses, we just you know put all those in it and then send that out. Again, we're going to have all of these cards. That's a possibility that they will be collected. Could you eat? Is this network organizing? Is this network? <laughs> That's what it is. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Yes, ma'am. There's a really fast way. Look at that. We're already becoming tech savvier. Yeah, if you got a phone, take a picture, and then you'll be able to take that back with you real quick. As opposed to what time was that again? Where was that again? I'm lost in the right. 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 We're trying to move past that. So uh, I'm going to hand this back to Lena to continue with the meeting. Um, I think next we're going to be hearing about the coalition details that are happening. But I have um, the next cards. And so if anybody is going to be a part of the lineup, you, I'm going to, you need to raise your hand and I will bring you a card. Okay? Okay. All right. Here, I'm going to hand this to Lena. Keep your hands up. Yes. And I'm going to take that page. And give me the... Uh, that's good. The one most important thing that you want to share, an event, a thought, one thing. Thank you. Uh, and this is a really good idea. And your idea about taking a picture is excellent. <laughs> Okay, so um, what we're going to do today, in addition to what Anne is, is, is working on, um, normally for those of you who are new, and also if you are new, um, okay, so if you are new, because I have a lot of people email me, so I'm going to email me, if you need to sign me, okay, and I'll, I'll talk to you afterwards. Uh, so what we're going to do today, though, instead of having a speaker, uh, it's, it's the end of the year, and the Interfaith Walker Coalition has done a lot of work this year, and we've grown a lot. And so I thought it would be good 
uh, to have some of our leadership just talk about what we've done in terms of what they're responsible for. And Jane, you are first up. Aren't you happy about that? <laughs> Jane Freak is the coordinator of the Backpack Ministry. And you know, uh, it is the front. It's the real, it's actually the first formalized thing I think the IWC did. I mean, in terms of a thing. Uh, we were at the bus station, but we weren't going really to organize. But we were organizing in the backpack. So, Holding this is hard for me. So, let me know if you can't hear me. I hold it. Jay. It's an ice cream cone. Yeah. Um, <laughs> all right. Um, this year, the important thing with uh, the backpacks is we've gone from making 250 a week to 450 a week. With that, in, that's because the bus station is, is very busy, increased. We, um, with that, the cost for the supplies for the backpacks has certainly gone up. Not only because we're buying more supplies, but the cost of some of the things that go in the backpacks has gone up. Um, I do have good news that the World Church Services have given us a huge number of blankets. They are a big expense for us. And the group from Boston that came this summer are continuing to buy our backpacks. So those are two of our most expensive backpacks. Um, the, the number of volunteers continues to grow, which is absolutely wonderful. Um, so much so that there is a plan to reorganize at the beginning of the year and probably start out with two days a week. Um, I want to say thank you not only to my volunteers but also to the group that take the backpacks down to Travis Park and to the bus station. They deliver 450 backpacks a week, usually two and at times, three times a week. And so, I thank them. Uh, questions? Do you still need volunteers? At this point, uh, I'm going to say yes, but I got to see if the number, like there were 12 new volunteers on Monday, so it was a zoo. Uh, I got to see how many of those are going to be my you know, like the ones that are going to come. Yeah, that are, because I have a wonderful core. So I'm going to say yes, where I'm putting off having them come until we know what's going to go on in January. Question? Well, is, this, is this a bit of a question um, about the Station has distributed 12,263. I don't know. Okay, the bus station 12,263. The airport 7,295 for a total of 19,558. So we are pretty sure that, uh, well, we've already done it, I'm sure, but by the end of the year, we will have distributed well over 20,000. Yeah, it was from January through November 30th. Okay. So, Barbara will talk about the airport in just a moment. Okay. Another question? I have a question about um, youth volunteers. Uh, because I have a high school student, but I've been getting a lot of questions from kids about how they can, if they can volunteer. We certainly take um, youth. Uh, if they are... <laughs> If they are under 12, I do want a parent to come with them, okay? 
Um, this past fall, I've had groups come. So we had a group from Univision. That was their service day. Um, uh, whatever day, Saturday, um, Planned Parenthood is going to be there. That's their second time, along with a group of teachers. And we will make that on uh, Saturday morning. I have a youth group from a church coming on Sunday afternoon. So if I get the volunteers to help me on these extra days, we will be open. Because youth won't need the service hours or things. I've had clubs that have contacted me. The other thing I want to say is San Antonio has been very active, but I have gotten donations filled backpacks from across the country. People from California, people from Seattle, New York, um, you name it. Even Little Rhode Island, they call themselves Little Rhode Island. They <laughs> sort of piggybacking on the youth thing, is there, I don't know what your logistics are in terms of where you get the other supplies, but could this be something that schools could do a supply drive? Yes, they do, because okay. I have someone delivering a hundred backpacks on Monday that um, fourth graders at a particular school did for their Christmas costumes. Uh, a year or two ago, we were getting weekly lists from the backpack ministry because the lists were changing quite rapidly. I don't know if today we're in the same place, but if we are, uh, how would folks who want to donate uh, find out uh, what the list is this week? I have the list that we put in the backpacks, a whole bunch of them, and I can put them on the table. Mm -hmm. They're on the website, too. But okay. if you want to carry something, I'll put them out on the table. Okay. It is consistent. It is consistent. Well, that's yeah. the issue. That so. was in, like, 2015s, early 16s. Yeah, <laughs> yes, but now that's right. That. Is there any issue with the old website versus the new website? Or good. I think enough people have hit it that it's now. Okay. I am going to say we do pack the backpacks at El Divino, Salvador Methodist Church. It's on the corner of Sazamora and West Woodlawn. And they have been absolutely wonderful as far as giving us space and we can expand in our space. Since the beginning. Since the beginning. It actually started in the casita, but I can remember being out in the hallway with a, a several Methodists, and they said, okay, let's see if we can. And El Divino was wonderful. Okay, so uh, a couple of things I just want to clarify. Um, Jane does several things. Someone asked about uh, collecting items. You can do that and just deliver the items to El Divino or to UPC, wherever. But then sometimes Jane will take backpacks to a group like she was just talking about, and those kids will collect the items and then make the backpacks. So there, she has several ways that people can help. Uh, the other thing I want you to hear is Jane is Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday. I mean, it has become a seven day a week job. And that is too much. So we're hoping, I keep encouraging her to find someone else who can take some of these things. Okay, so the next person to speak will be uh, Sister Denise LaRock, and that is the uh, bus station. Okay. Um, we've been busy. <laughs> That's the first thing. Um, just in November, November, um, we served 1,595 families at the bus station. So, um, you know, multiply that, what, by 2.5, and you get how many, um, so it's, it's a lot. Already uh, 721 for the Sunday. So a lot of families. Um, we've, we've also gotten a lot of volunteers in the last couple of months. Um, I, we have a very strong core who uh, every week, same time, same day, and I think that's what really keeps us going. We're working on trying to get some of these other volunteers more integrated to be more consistent because 
you know, like this morning there are two people <laughs> at the bus station despite, you know, all the new volunteers. So we have enough for this afternoon. But, you know, so we're working on getting that integrated. Carolina Barrera, uh, I don't know how many of you know her. She's taken um, over the overall volunteer piece, which has been amazing. So um, all those initial contacts uh, through our, our um, email and stuff like that, all the paperwork, she's the one processing that and working with Anastasia to do background checks. And, and then she contacts myself or um, or you, Barbara? Yes. Is that who she's contacting now? Okay, <laughs> welcome. <laughs> Thank you for taking that on. Um, and then we do the orientation and get them going and so on. So, um, so she's been fantastic. She's in Mexico for an uh, ill family member, and she's still doing it. <laughs> I'm still getting messages like, so-and-so wants to go to orientation, can they come to you know. So she's just uh, been incredible. So uh, thank you for her, even though she's not here. Um, uh, one of the, the big things we've been working on is the, the network, the Greyhound Network. Um, there are, as you know, groups in uh, McAllen and other places who are helping at the bus stations also. Um, the Grannies Respond have a number of locations, um, mostly on the East Coast, like three cities in uh, Tennessee, Atlanta. They're trying to get set up in Houston and um, Dallas. Some of these people have been kicked out by Greyhound simply because they're like, who are you, why you're here, we don't want you, we don't know what you're up to. And so um, Jan and I have been in contact uh, with them. Um, we met with some of the people from Texas this past Saturday um, to see how we can, um, you know, set up some best practices and all those things and procedures and policies that have worked so well for us that they can take on also. Um, we have a very good relationship with Greyhound here in San Antonio. And Robert uh, Quintana, Quintana, who's the manager there, is just amazing. Yeah. And it turns out that he let us go ahead with all this without any corporate permission or whatever. Yeah. So we've been the, the, the road pilot project. But very effective because now um, I had a conference call with Robert and one of the VPs, um, I don't know, two weeks ago, and they were saying, could, could IWC like take over like the coordination of all the bus stations? <laughs> <laughs> That's what I said. <laughs> That's exactly what I said. He said, you know, like kind of Red Cross. And I said, um, no. I said, we're all volunteers. We have no paid staff. I said, you know, we can do what we can to help. Um, you know, Jane and I worked for the last two weeks to really try and put all our stuff in writing. Um, how to work with Greyhound, how to like act like their friends and respect them like you would with the families, you know? Because sometimes, you know, we get that advocacy fire and we just like fight, 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 you know? And it, it doesn't work when you're trying to collaborate. <laughs> so, um, so the VP asked us to, to work on that. We, we met with some of the people from Texas. Um, we're sending back um, our paperwork with our revisions to the VP uh, for Greyhound to see what we can do. Uh, Tino is somewhere, there you are. Um, Tino came for a little while uh, to help us at the meeting also, and what he's helping us with is we're really trying to come up with um, a template, that's what we've been asked to do, a template for an agreement for each of these places. And we don't want to be like one connected, one organization network, because if someone messes up in Knoxville, we don't want to get kicked out too. And I made that very clear too. To the VP also. But so Tino's working, um, connected us with some lawyers and he's done a lot of background work with us to see what kind of agreement we can come up with that you know we can use to make our thing official, but it's really more so for these other places to, to get them started um, and get the permission to be in there. And Greyhound had a great concern. They had a situation in California where a group came in and they were helping. They were taking information from the families and then um, referring them to their own legal places and charging the families. So we were like, oh gosh, aren't we naive? <laughs> but it never dawned on us that you know, people are trying to rip them off. Why we would think that? Because everyone does. But, um, uh, so, so some protections for the families and all that. So that's what we've been working on. Um, 
Oh, we're working on a, a medical project too. Jenny, you want to talk some about that? And I think that's any questions for me before I hand over the mic? Yes. Many, what, uh, what's your sense of how many um, points of connection throughout this network? At the moment? Yeah. Um, at the moment, uh, let's see, uh, Dallas, Houston, Memphis, uh, Nashville, Knoxville. They said they have someone in Richmond. Um, we've gotten contact from someone in Sacramento. Uh, we know like El Paso has people, but they're still overwhelmed with their own people that <laughs> just keep going. Um, those are the main places, but I just got, uh, we got an email uh, from people in uh, Charlotte, North Carolina. Uh, actually, I'm going to talk to her today, who's also interested. So the, the Granny Network, I don't know, you heard they did the caravan down to the border and all that. Well, they've been trying to organize, and this is one thing they're working on. Their coordinator is actually in New York. So I think, you know, once we have this template and these guidelines, that's something, you know, things that can be handed to people and say, you know, here, here's your infrastructure. <laughs> and then, you know, because each bus station is different. You know, um, I think it's Memphis, their focus is food and coats and stuff. So that takes, you know, the heat off of us. The heat off of us, heat off of us <laughs> to provide those things. Because, you know, in our bus station, you know, you say, uh, do you need a hat? Everybody needs a hat. Do you need a coat? Everyone, they're like, you're going to Miami. You know, so they, they don't get those differences. And so that'll kind of take that off as far as some of the, those colder weather needs being met for the world. Um, also in Dallas, uh, they have a huge problem with bus, major bus delay. But buses being delayed and then people being there more than 12 hours. And so uh, those delays, and then, the other thing they said was shoes, that people are coming without shoes. And we're like, everybody who comes through our place has shoes. We know we get the Detroit <coughs> people, but like the Brownsville, Knoxville. So we're figuring it's people coming um, from the more western areas that have those issues. So, so it'll be kind of unique what are the needs in different places. Any other questions? <coughs> okay, briefly. Um, I think, as, as most of you know, we, um, we hand out basic medicines at the bus station. Everybody has an upper respiratory infection. All the volunteers have an upper respiratory infection. And so what we provide are simple over-the-counter medicines for symptom relief. I mean, our guidelines are, are, are do no harm, provide comfort, and, and ease suffering. Um, and 99 and 9 tenths percent of the time, that's all that's required. I would say in the last couple of years, the number of, of adults and children who have actually required medical care, I mean, we can count on, on one hand. But we don't have anything formal in place. I mean, Sister JT has been wonderful trying to facilitate that. But, you know, we decided that it's time for us to actually have a protocol. So if you're encountering someone at the bus station or the airport who needs medical care, you don't want to have to scramble at that point. So um, uh, uh, with Sister JT's guidance and assistance, we've been reaching out um, to um, the Health Science Center. Um, they have um, the Robert B. Green campus downtown, which is very proximal um, to the bus station. Um, Sister JT has a contact. And Sister Sharon and I reached out to uh, Dr. Andrew Muck, who we encountered at, at Tino's um, uh, rep, um, Immigration and Healthcare Seminar. He just happens to be the head of Refugee Healthcare and the uh, Go figure. Yeah, and the, and the head of emergency medicine. So Sharon and I were on him like a dirty shirt um, after <laughs> the seminar was over. And he's just a lovely man. And he said that he would do everything to help us. So I followed up with an email to him. I heard back from him. And he said, I'm, I'm connecting with people. And I'm very, very interested in making this happen for you. So um, uh, the Brady Green Campus has both pediatric and adult urgent care services. So that if we have um, a formalized agreement with them to provide services to our families, that would be great. So that is a work in progress, and I'm, I'm very optimistic that between Sister JT's contacts and, and Dr. Muck, that we'll be able to make that happen. Oh, yes, yeah, Sister, of course. Um, uh, downtown Krista Santa Rosa Children's Hospital. Um, uh, and again, with Sister JT's contact with, um, uh, with Sister Michelle, um, uh, they have had an understanding that when, with IWC that when we have sick children, 
um, that's um, the, 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 the uh, agreement that we've had in place so far. So, yeah, we thank you for pointing that out to me. We're very grateful to them for that. Anything else, Sister? <laughs> As someone who really likes organization and spent most of my career in or it just makes me so excited <laughs> that, that this is the work that's being done. I mean, it's like every individual is just stepping up. I'm talking about all of y'all. <laughs> stepping up and making things better. Okay, so the next um, ministry is the airport ministry. We've got the backpacks, the bus station, the airport. So. Oh, this is Barbara Eden. This is Eden. Eden, sorry. This is your first time? Okay, I'm so sorry. But anyway, Barbara has taken, is helping us at least for the moment with the airport ministry because we lost our coordinator and we're trying to work that out. So, Barbara, thank you. Hi, I'm the team leader for Tuesday's mornings at the airport and uh, Paula Henderson. Talk into the mic. Oh, there you go. Hi. Um, Paula Henderson had really got this airport ministry going, I guess, over a year ago, right? Mm -hmm. And, uh, but she's got kind of tired out doing so many things, so she's stepped, stepped back on her activities. But, uh, so, right now we're kind of reorganizing our, the leadership, and so I was asked to present this to you today. Um, I've been there about a year at the airport, and I love it because I'm only 10 minutes away. I live there, and I was a retired Spanish teacher, and it's just like God just, hey, Barbara, you better get over there. <laughs> and my husband drops me off and picks me up, so it's a, it's a nice situation. And, um, but uh, just uh, the past month, uh, just from December 1st till the 11th, we had 379 families um, coming through the airport. Now we had, in the past, I think late October, Carn City was not sending for a while. Uh, the men, and that was right after those uh, family separations. But now Carn City is stepping back up, and they usually come in the afternoons. And I know just uh, this Tuesday there were 19 families from Carn City, uh, but that is included in my total number. Um, now um, our number of volunteers are growing, but it's kind of like the backpack. They they'll kind of come, and we let them shadow. Um, to see what it's like, because it's, it's a lot of steps at the airport. Um, you know, they, they arrive, we greet them, we are always very nice to the trail boss bus drivers. I think they're guards or security guards or something, and they, you know, they've got all the stuff. And we're real nice to them. And they, um, they really are not supposed to leave till they know everyone has a plane ticket, because there's been mix-ups where they go, okay, here they are, bye. And then they get back to Dilly, and we have to call to say, well, there's someone here that doesn't even have a ticket out of San Antonio, and you need to come back and get them. So it goes up and down with that. But um, just basically, there are a lot of steps because we have to um, we give them their backpacks. We greet them and tell them who we are and why we're there, and so that they can relax that we have nothing to do with the government. And so they're very happy when we say they're a religious group. And um, then they, um, then we have to look at their itineraries, and we give them a, a backpack. Now, in the backpack, we have a lovey, and we've been going through all sorts of toys over the years, of dolls for the girls, teddy bears for the boys, and then sometimes we couldn't get the dolls, and then so now we're all teddy bears because they're, you know, mm -hmm. gender neutral. neutral. So they all get teddy bears and the snack inside. And the reason that the backpacks are important for them is they come with all of their belongings in these kind of bags, okay, all different colors. And number one, it, um, they have no place to secure their valuables. There's no purse, they don't have purses. They often don't have wallets. And so we like, uh, it's good that they can take, when we give them their tickets, they secure them with a zipper in the pouch and um, so that they don't lose them. Also, they can, we tell them when we explain security, what they can and cannot take, then they, when they have time to move some of the things from the bag, 
to a backpack that they can wear on their shoulders. And even if they've got two bags, sometimes they have three, they've at least got an extra hand to hold their little, little one's hand and, you know, take care of the kid because they've got the backpack on their back. And we tell the kids, I usually wait until we get to the gate, you know, I tell them, you're going to learn English, you're going to get to go to school, and you're going to take this backpack to school. And so we all, uh, we finally figured out we have to be careful to have boy colors and girl colored backpacks because the boys do not want pink. No way. Now the girls will take any color, but uh, not the boys. So um, also, um, they look like other passengers. They have backpacks. You know, they already kind of stand out when people are looking at them. You know, so it makes them feel, hey, you know, look, I'm like others. Um, now, um, as far as problems, TSA staff has been very helpful. We're always very nice to TSA, very nice, and to the ticket agents. And um, they, a, lot of, a lot of them speak Spanish, but we have had some problems with the, the mother's net last name on their ID is not necessarily like the child's. And so they're going, well, who, well, how much, who is this, and whose name is this? And then the tickets, they run out of room to write all the last, the two last names. So then it cuts off and they go, well, how do I know that the, uh, well, look at you know, their picture, and them. So anyway, we've had some things like that happen, but overall they're very helpful, especially with the moms that are wearing um, ankle monitors. So we do ask them ahead of time, are you wearing a monitor? So that when we line up for security, we tell them ahead of time, you cannot, your child cannot go through the x-ray machine with you. you they have, they're going to go through a machine right next to you. You will see them. They're not far away. They're right there. So prepare them. Explain to them that this is what's going to happen. And so the security will let me or someone go through with them, with the child. But like Tuesday, we had like nine children. You know, and as they came through, I, they let me just, TSA let me stay on the other side, and so I would just go, come to me, come to me, we're going to watch for mommy. And so they could see mommy through the glass, and so that was helpful. But we've had some babies before that were very upset, they don't understand. Um, now, um, the only other thing is uh, problems that come up are, we've had several, it's gotten better, we've had families show up, dropped off, that are leaving out of Houston. <laughs> For New York or something, and so they're not from San Antonio. So there are two anonymous ticket agents have saved their, my life because I said, "Well, what are we going to do?" And they fixed it magically, and they are to remain anonymous. But um, one of my coworkers found um, wasn't as lucky, and they were going to charge seven hundred dollars for a mom and her son to fly, uh, to change the flight from San Antonio to their destination from then Houston. So, uh, that member of my team drove them to Houston. He drove them to Houston and took them to the airport and on the way, they were very, um, you, they looked stressed, this family looked very stressed and we didn't know why they weren't smiling because I said, he's going to, explain Spanish, he's going to take y'all to the airport, it's a miracle, and they're just going, you know. Well, on the way, they talked with him, and they had just been reunited. And so they were just shell-shocked. So we have to be very aware of that and read the body language. Um, and of course, we've had the bad weather delays and things like that lately with bad weather. Um, and uh, but we have Casa now. Casita uh, can take some of the. And we have a we have people to call. All the team leaders know what to do if someone misses their flight. It's very comforting to know we have we have a hierarchy of numbers to call and that we can reassure them. Um, the other problem is well we have they get up at four in the morning at Dilly to come to our airport and they get there about 10 30 quarter till 11 because they stop at the bus station sometimes and so um some of them don't have a flight till four o'clock or six o'clock they have no money 
So that is, that's hard, you know, because sometimes I'll try to buy them food, but it's very expensive at the airport. It's a ripoff. Now we do have an anonymous little food store there uh, that if the right employees are there, they'll give us free food. That's only in Terminal A, but anyway. Okay. Um, so I just, and the sick children doesn't seem to be as bad lately, would you say? Oh, okay, I haven't seen the chicken pox yet. Okay, um, but we love getting them, uh, we have a little medicine bag uh, that was supplied to us by, um, through UPC, you know, I'm sure from y'all. <laughs> and uh, it's really nice to have the little baby's aspirin, liquid aspirin to give them. It's okay if it's small, they'll let it go through. And, um, and then it was just kind of funny because I bought this little children's cough medicine. It's really dark honey. A little pack of little honey bee on it. And so I'll hear him coughing, but the first time I did that, I asked a little boy, Tiene tos? Do you have a cough? He goes, yeah. And so then I got it out, and then all the other little children were going, Tengo tos? Tengo tos? So I went, okay. So now I wait till we get to the gate, one on one, and I'll give them, give them now. Um, Lots of people uh, have been helping and telling us thank you. Um, and um, like last week, the fathers from Carn City, oh, and by the way, the kids are a lot better behaved with the fathers in the afternoon. I'm almost done, I'm sorry. I'm going to say too much. Uh, but anyway, um, he, I was getting ready to leave, and he, he organized all these extra bags and folded them for me, cleaned up all the litter around there and did all that. Because he wants to help, and you know, it's just so so rewarding. Okay. Thank you. Sorry. We could use English speakers to help get the tickets. That would be a big help and give out the backpacks. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, uh, Joe, the next part of our thing is our overnight stays, and Joe, can you make a Kind of breathing, kind of running out of time here. Yeah, I, I, I couldn't do this without without Jeffrey Saint Jeffrey here. Uh, uh, so let me introduce him first. Uh, Jeffrey uh, is the one is the Catholic Charities person who drives the van, and he is he has become our most important, most frequent transporter of families from to and from the bus station to and from the, the, uh, the airport. And so um, um, he'll tell you about Casa Nacho, uh, the Catholic Charities place for overnight. But first let me mention, let me just tell you what we're doing with overnight because this is new. Uh, well, new since late last spring, I think. Um, we um, when a family at the airport or the bus station is stranded overnight or over two nights or so, uh, we want to find them shelter. We don't want them to have to spend the night in the bus station or the airport. And so, uh, so we began, uh, we began uh, looking for host families, which was marginally successful. Uh, at this point, we have a list of about 30 it is successful. We have a list of about 30 families who have said that they would, would be willing to uh, to shelter a family overnight uh, if they're stranded. Uh, and the sheltering involves also going to pick them up at the bus station or the airport and then returning them to the bus station or airport at the time of their departure. Uh, but in the meantime, late in the summer, early in September, um, the uh, La Casa de Maria y Marta uh, formerly known as Casa Raices, uh, reopened on a totally different basis. It's uh, just four bedrooms downstairs, um, and the, the focus is uh, not just on shelter, but it's on trauma-informed healing. And, um, and so that's the first, the first place for shelter would be La Casa. Uh, if the family uh, is a, a father and child, then we, um, we are now trying to um, send them to Casa Nacho, which 
which Jeffrey will tell you about. Uh, and they used to have mother families at, uh, at La Casa. And once both of these houses are full, then we, uh, we call families to, to shelter. Um, so I'm gonna have Jeffrey tell you about his, his thing and his numbers. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Um, yeah, what about you said one of the things that Catholic Charities um, kind of the gap that was being seen was the transportation. And so since we have our nice um, after school vans and buses and stuff like that, we started being able to, being able to use those, um, especially when there's a larger number of people stranded at the bus or the airport um, that can fit in Joe's car. Um, <laughs> and so in November, we provide about 54 rides, um, either to Casa Nacho, um, Casa Marimarta hotels, or host families. Um, and we transport about 50 families and 117 individuals. Uh, and then, but like she said, we also have Casa Nacho where we provide overnight stay, um, mostly to, to uh, when there's men. Um, Casa Nacho is uh, not named after the chips uh, and <laughs> cheese. Um, the place where they are um, is run by Jesuits, and the founder of the Jesuits was San Ignacio de Loyola, and Nacho short for uh, Ignacio. So, in case you're wondering why it's called Casa Nacho, um, and we have 41 individuals stay there in uh, November. Um, and also in November, we, uh, Catholic Charities, if there's um, more overflow, we help provide uh, pay for hotel nights. Um, Casa Nacho, uh, provide almost the same amount of stays to families in November as we did October. Um, but hotels was a lot less. Uh, and I think in October, there was a lot more um, concentrated number of nights where families needed shelter. And so, uh, whereas in November, it was more spread out. And so we didn't need to use the hotels as much as we did in October, uh, thankfully. Um, we didn't have any host families or people staying at Airbnb. Um, thankfully, there is um, a few families that have offered use of Airbnbs that they have when they're not using them for customers, um, but we didn't need to use any of those in November. Um, in case you're curious where the families that we have our stay are from, the um, majority of uh, them were from Honduras, Guatemala, and then we had one family from Angola. Um, both Casa Maria Marta and Casa Nacho have had Congolese families as well. Um, and then um, the top states that families are going to from Casa Nacho is Florida, Georgia, Illinois, New York, North Carolina, and Texas, just in case you're curious. Um, again, with, with this stuff, there's like no, very little planning you can do, so some of those numbers are just, you know, out of curiosity's sake rather than um, being helpful for preparing your planning. Um, but like I said, um, it is interesting information to know. Um, and most of the families that stay at Casa Nacho are a single parent with uh, one child. Uh, with Casa Nacho, we have three bed or three places we can hold two bedrooms and a living room. Um, we did have um, two families that were made with three people. Um, some of those a husband and wife with the child, and the, but most of them are usually one parent with two kids. Um, also, to let you know. Um, I will be leaving at the end of the month. I have some family stuff um, that I have to work that will require me to uh, not be working at the charities full time. Um, still be involved, still be involved as much as I can. Um, but I will be um, leaving in a few weeks. Um, and so, if you know anyone, any volunteers especially that are involved in this and they want a job, <laughs> um, they can visit the Catholic Charities website and apply there. Um, it's helpful if you don't have a life. Uh, to <laughs> <laughs> you know, it is obviously, as you all know, this is, this is very rewarding work, and this is very important work. Um, we, we need to be welcoming these people. We need to be um, providing them this hope. And so, uh, it is definitely a great place to work at Catholic Chinese. And uh, the short time that I've been here, um, I have definitely learned a lot, and, and it's been an amazing experience. Um, I love all of you even if I don't know you, but uh, yeah. So, um, Catholic Charities website, we should have the job posting soon. Okay. So, thank you.
And in November, he still wasn't registered. It was just one thing after another. And so after one of her accompaniments, I said, well, let's just go. Let's just go to the school. And sadly, it wasn't until I got there. And they were also giving me a hard time. And I had to say, well, I guess I have to call Molda. And uh, <laughs> I didn't even know anyone. I'm like, oh, no. <laughs> name dropping. You know, they're like, oh, no, oh, ma'am. Oh, no, I, let's get the counselor. I'm like, yes, please do. And, but it was sad that I had to take it to that point. Because here's this mother from Honduras, went through this, this, this horrific experience, had to do this heavy traveling, and then she was doing everything right, got all the paperwork and everything, and then it wasn't until the gringa had to go in there, you know, and, and be there to make it happen, and the child could start the next day. That's ridiculous. That shouldn't be happening. And we need to let our districts know, no, no, sir. And this, and this wasn't a Hispanic, this was Edgewood. Oh, oh shock. <laughs> and, and yes, and so that's that's why I was like, no, no, ma'am, I need to talk to someone now. And then you know I did that crazy name dropping, <laughs> but it worked. And and then after that, days later, I got a phone. Oh, Miss Brett, oh, could you could we talk? What happened? I'm like I just flat out put it out there. This shouldn't be happening. Mm -hmm. And so hopefully that won't happen again. And there's some district who are wonderful. Northside ISD is wonderful. You know, of course, you have the San Antonio ISD, South San Jose ISD is, is wonderful. In the Northeast, we're working with them. But something that I'm, I'm working on is connecting to the uh, teachers associations in those areas to develop a relationship, to make it easier. So that mother, she just goes, fills out the paperwork, and there you go, that's it. So that we don't have to step in. You know, it's, they need to have that empowerment. OK, spoke real quick. Questions? No? Thank you. Okay. Each of these, um, these programs are their own part of their, their satellite. I mean, but it's like everybody's developing their own thing. Okay, Terry, can you talk about collaboration? You can see the, uh, the need for collaboration and at the same time for for being very brief in our our announcements. Our, uh, I typed out what I was going to say, and I can say it. What we would like to shoot for is reports, just like we're asking from the collaborate the partners, that we can put online uh, so that important things can be posted later on and so we know dates and things. So, uh, we're looking forward to hearing from our partners. It's very important. And our normal speakers that we have, it's very important. But uh, I sure appreciate collaboration that is going on. And advocacy is that. Yes, right. Because of the work of our, our collaborators group, we have come in even greater contact with people who have the same heart and the same passion with regard to brothers and sisters. I was just telling somebody I was coming home from well, someplace in Brooklyn, and there was a sign that said, Methodist this way, Baptist this way, and I said, well, that doesn't work anymore. <laughs> I'm right on the fact that we come from faith based. Expressed differently in some ways, but not really when it comes to the heart and the work. So I'm ever so grateful that we get we, we are who we are together. I'm going to go modify that sign more. Do you know what I get away with that? <laughs> um, what we're doing today, we're meeting at 1130. We're going to meet in the center of the room so we don't take positions, right? If you believe that, I can tell you something else. And then on the table over there, I put again the longing for information sheet that we got from um, the work more Gavin Burke group up in Austin. And also, this is much bigger than what JT does. Uh, she, has, she has these wonderful little cards. But um, I'm asking you if you can today, or send us in later, 
um, looking at your at the Capital Texas that, that, that site to put down the information about what district you're in, um, who your U.S. rep is, etc. The information we need to do the advocacy that we need to do. And as you know, the Texas legislature starts in January. And we're already getting information from some of the groups to collaborate with with the legislation that they're looking at. And so we'll be making that more and more available to you. Um, we have had um, the reader group, we talked about the trust, the senior, the tri triple P, the mover, the San Antonio stands. Each one brings perspectives and different relationships to what we do. Now I know Denise, when I live with, said about we like each other most days. Advocacy, fire, fight, fight, fight. Well, we do, but it's more about relationships. Um, one of the best concerts we've had for our community says, she's like, why do you human like this? But she doesn't fight. But she would say to us, be curious rather than furious. Mm -hmm. Then you get the conversation going. Mm -hmm. God knows, and we know, if our country needed it, it's not. And how to have those conversations, whether it's your airport, or with the bus people, or in Austin, or here in Austin, to model, to live what we say. Not that Jesus had an easy life. Jesus was one of the prophets had uh, an easy life doing that. But if you could fill this out, it would help enormously. And then we'll be putting um, information on the website or in, in different places uh, available to all of us so that when there are meetings coming up, uh, many of these groups organize days of action in Austin and will publish, as we know it, when it's coming up, what they're talking about, and what the process is if you haven't done that before. And going to Austin is quite an experience in many, many ways. And so we will, be, we will do that and be very curious. We can be curious inside and we'll take our crypto visible afterwards, but we'll say it's in the way of our, that our faith draws us to. And those of you that are in the committee were meeting in the middle of the room right after this meeting. Thank you. who has for years uh, provided us with a lot of information every year. I hope everyone got the two handouts that we had on the on the uh, side table there. If not, please um, take them. We just keep expanding them uh, just because there's so much news uh, all the time and immediately they're out of date. So. <laughs> um, but we have the immigration, uh, immigrant family detention update, and uh, we participate in that the, uh, the twice a month on the second and the fourth uh, Tuesdays in those calls to try to get the numbers. So you see in here, we say as of December the 10th, uh, 486 individuals in Carnes and then estimated 1,900 individuals detained in Dilly. So that's where we get those in, that information from, uh, that call. There's people on that call from really all over, uh, including other states and other, um, you know, other than just us here in Texas. But this you know, focuses on those two. And then we just keep expanding. Uh, remember, we had the font so small you could hardly read it, but now we have like two pages of the court filings uh, where we try to just keep documenting what's going on there. And then the other two pages of that particular handout are some of the things where you can take action or uh, volunteer or some of the things that are coming up. And so uh, we use the city's update as well as any of the things that uh, we get from uh, on that particular call that I'm talking about or others that send us information. So if you don't see something on there, if you could uh, talk to me afterwards and we'll get it on there. Usually like next week then we finalize these, put them in a PDF and then send them to Sister Denise and many others that uh, post them. And um, the second handout is just articles. We started doing this because there's just so much in the news to try to keep track of. And it's one way, I think, to, to constantly document what is happening. And so uh, you see in there uh, just a number of articles on about the public charge proposal. Uh, there was one that this one was very good. So we, um, you know, my helper Reuben, who's not here with me today, his dad is in the hospital. So we hold him up in prayer. 
but also just uh, many of the other um, asylum claims, asylum denials, the whole thing on the federal appeals courts. And um, we, there's, there's one article about on page three here. He built an empire with detained migrant children as the bricks. And that's on that Southwest Key that we've heard so much about. So again, you know, just trying to uh, document some of the things there, his salary and you know, what, what all the different um, grants that he's taking to make that possible. And then uh, Texas suing us here in San Antonio over the sanctuary, sanctuary city violation. And we'll add in here, there was a long, art, um, what do you call it, on the editorial page, uh, uh, you know, supporting our city over this um, lawsuit that the state is filing against us. And then uh, just other things here, and at the bottom of that page, Texas ruling may allow sentencing of migrant family detention. Uh, a number of you in the room, when we went to Austin, whenever that was in 2015, at the end, in December, right around this time, when we all testified, and so again, we'll have to be, you know, keeping on top of that and seeing, you know, if they're going to try to license Carnes and Dilly. So, uh, you know, we just constantly. And then this, the whole thing of just trying to keep track of the detention centers, you know, the migrant kids in Tornillo and what was a temporary shelter and is now more permanent. And then uh, the very last thing that we have on here for today is the record 14,000 unaccompanied immigrant children in U.S. custody uh, as confirmed by uh, Health and Human Services. Um, you know, we were saying all summer, why are they just talking about the unaccompanied minors when we knew they had 11,000 in custody over the summer? So now, finally, some of those figures are being consolidated and coming out. And um, on that first page here too, we try to look at the budget, our U.S. Uh, budget, and uh, document what's being paid out. And so we only have the things here for uh, 2017 and, um, the, and then 2018. We were looking into this current budget, which is being <laughs> whatever you want to say, uh, you know, debated and uh, bandied around. Uh, and it, it's you know, the budget is over, I don't know, it's over a thousand pages, and when we try to download it, we have to be specific almost because it, like, crashes our, our computer. <laughs> so, anyway, so we're still working on that piece of it to get it more updated. But you can see that it's a process. And, uh, you know, they have in the, in the budget the actual figures of what they want to pay out. Uh, and, uh, like, in the ones that we had here, they actually had the ones for the different detention centers. Now there's so many and these other, you know, like Tornillo and some of this other, we will try to see, like, are they actually putting those in the budget too or exactly how that's going to work. So stay tuned. But anyway, so next week we'll put these into PDFs and then make them available. But in the meantime, please take the, you know, the handouts and use them with your committees and, you know, in any way that you can. And uh, we feel like this is our part, you know, the Benedictine, I'm with the Benedictine Sisters for those that are new in our monasteries in Bernie, and this is our piece of the uh, Interfaith Welcome uh, Coalition work. So. Okay, uh, this is, for those of you who are new, this is an unusual thing in that I, we had everybody give the reports, uh, and that's not something that will happen every month. Uh, only when we have specific things to tell you. So, Anne, you know, do your best. <laughs> <laughs> so, we now have 19 minutes for this portion of it. Um, always a good thing in terms of meetings to use the golden rule. Recognizing that we want to respect others the way we wish to be respected ourselves, respect time, one of our most valuable assets, the way we want our time respected as well, to ask of others that which we're willing to ask of ourselves. So we, we that's what we're trying to do. Um, so Bill has taken them in, and uh, we've had some that have already been announced. I've moved this over so you have full access to the screen in case you want to take a photograph. I've also set a timer on my phone for 90 seconds. Um, 
Bill, let's see. Show us the first ones you've got. And we're going to review a couple really quick. So this one I already did as the example. We're not going to linger here because you already had it. Okay. Next, Bill. Okay. At it. Slow machine here. Sorry. And those who are part of the lineup, you need to be lining up. So Tino, et cetera, et cetera. But we're going to take them in the order that they're on the screen. Give it a little time. We can turn down some lights if that will help. For some reason, it is not responding. For some reason, Bill doesn't want to do it. I mean, I mean, he's trying. That's exactly what he's trying to do. Okay. Are you embarrassed, Bill? I feel for you. I'm offering a little empathy and compassion. That was said with compassion. Okay. Still believe. Here we go. So this was done earlier. The Newtown Foundation, who I'm not familiar with, but the National Vigils and Events to End Gun Violence. There's an event tonight at 7 p.m., the Chapel of Incarnate Word. Um, there's a contact uh, location during one of hundreds of vigils and events nationwide on the sixth anniversary of the Sandy Hook shooting tragedy to help slash. All right, if you want to take a picture, now's the time to take it. Next one. Uh, so, Tino, you're up. Okay, just one, right? Yeah. Hi, uh, Tino Gallego from the Immigration Liaison for the City of San Antonio. Still. So, what I wanted to report on was uh, the, the public charge comment that the deadline for the comments on this regulation were up last Monday. We spoke about it at the convening uh, two Mondays ago, on the 3rd. We had a presentation about it uh, from the Center for Public Policy Priorities, and we had some Q&A with some attorneys. But so really what I wanted to just to let to update you on, number one, the city did submit a comment. Uh, I, I helped prepare. It's 31 pages long. It has a lot of great information. I want to find a way to share that with you. So we're going to run it through the appropriate channels and see how we can do that. The second part of this um, that I wanted to share with you, uh, just first of all, 210,000 comments were received on this regulation from all across the country. Uh, uh, Many, many people had something to say. Most of them um, were very critical of the proposal. Um, and so at this point, the government, in, in, the, in the regulation process, they have to consider those comments and then you know, either, either address them and altering what they're doing and the regulation they're proposing, change it, or justify why they're still going to do what they're going to do. So that's, that's now the balls in the, in, uh, the Homeland Security's court with their regulation. But what I wanted to talk to you about a little bit was um, an action item we have for this, which is that we are looking to kind of get the word out there to our communities. A lot of confusion about what this rule said, what it didn't say, who affected, what it didn't affect. And one of the reasons I wanted to bring lawyers in to the convening on, on December 3rd was, was just to come up with a strategy for how to talk to the community about it. So um, we are going to be working on that and, and trying to find a message that is appropriate to just address our once again. Next slide. Uh, heard this before, Seattle Peace Chorus, they need housing for singers. They're here January 23rd through the 26th. Where would that be? At your house. If you have room in the inn, you contact Mary Grace. If you're not taking a photo now, you should be. Can you house a singer or two? We're good? We're good. Next slide. Still the Seattle Peace Chorus, but these are performances. There's the one on January 24th. There's some other stuff coming up. Mary Grace would know that information as well. Take your photo now. So next time when IWC comes, they need to fill out these cards as well with announcements. FYI. Ready? They're still there. It's not happening. 
because they're still taking pictures. You should be taking your pictures earlier, not at the end of the announcement, <laughs> during it. Okay, next slide. Domesticas Unidas. Hello, everyone. Um, a couple of updates. First of all, uh, my topic is digesting our mindset. First of all, we cannot cover all bases. I don't want everybody to be tired out. You don't have to do it all. You can hire a domestic worker. There you go. <laughs> and pay her a decent wage. That's another adjustment on our mindset. Because some people hire somebody and then they get back to me and say, I've never paid so much. I tell them, because you're paying poverty wages locally. So change the mindset, all right? We went to the World Social Forum on Migration in Mexico City. And we took a message about how immigrant women and children are being separated from their families. But also, I took this report. Thank you, Benedictus. It was very useful, letting them know what the community is doing about it. So the world knows what is happening here and also what our community is doing about it. And I was so proud to be able to take that report. Uh, we were interviewed by Italian press, people from France, from Germany, from Switzerland, because this was a world social forum. And it was amazing. Yes, we talked about the, the wretched situation for our immigrant community. And since we are Domestica Sunidas, our women are those women that are here, not only traveling through, but actually live here and need to support their families. And I appreciate very much what the community is doing. Thank you so much. By the way, the timer is set for 90 seconds. Everybody's given 60, so you have to be granting a little compassion there. Okay, next slide. Raises. Thank you. My name is Nate Roeder. I'm with Raices, um, and we're not going to take 90 seconds because we just have one thing, so I want to spend some time just doubling that message that if you're wondering why you're paying so much, it's because fair wages come at a price, and immigrant rights are workers' rights. They are one and the same, but thank you, Domesticas Unidas, for, for putting that forth. Um, so the big thing we've got coming up, toy and book drive. Uh, Details forthcoming, you can keep checking our website for that, but this is part of our effort to kind of engage young people in San Antonio. This comes from the idea of one of our volunteers at the bus station who wants to have a toy book drive in their high school. So it's gonna be on a specific date that's coming up. We don't have that set yet. Um, so check our website, thanks. slide, Metro Health, Hudit had to leave, and it really is in partnership with what um, Tino talked about, but somehow or other getting some messaging out. The action portion of this meeting, if you have not been before, comes pretty much during this and right after, a real networking time. So if you're somebody who's interested in doing some of that mes messaging around the public charge, there's Hudit's contact information, and you can also talk to Tino, who's still with us. All right, next slide. Oh, I forgot to ask for more cards. Are we good? Yes, yeah, so we have these two and then... And All right, we'll get to it. We'll put the cards in after. We'll get better. Hi, my name is Rebecca Flores and I'm with a Toy and Food Coalition. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. San Antonio Stands is a collaborative that the Pro Immigrant Coalition is part of, but also the Interfaith Welcome Coalition, also with uh, uh, Sister Sharon and other uh, Terry and uh, uh, we are now lobbying the City Council to vote for an ordinance rather than a, only a regulation to change uh, the rules on citation and release. These are to provide as, uh, as a ticket to uh, people who have minor uh, crimes. And those are driving without a valid license, uh, less than four ounces of marijuana, theft of services less than 750, or theft of property less than 750, graffiti, I think is up in the air still, uh, and uh, criminal trespass mischief, uh, mischief less than $750 in damage. And so we had initially wanted a, a reg 
But now because of this issue with uh, Chief McManus, we wanted an ordinance. We wanted as an ordinance because an ordinance will be there after you know if, if anybody if they try to oust uh, McManus from my position, he's been supportive. Uh, but you know you know how things work in the city. So anyway, um, we're going to uh, ask you maybe through the internet here to contact um, your city council members to uh, push for a vote on the ordinance uh, for citation and release. Thank you. Rebecca, we have seven more seconds. Thank you. By the way, Rebecca is going to be one of our San Antonio Peace Laureates next year. So, I'll learn more about that soon. And Sister Denise, you know. I'm, I'm the migrant center for human rights right now. This is like a quarter inch thick. We're talking to this. Take us too long. <laughs> <laughs> so long. Um, their, their intern came late and left early. Anyway, so um, the Migrant Center for Human Rights, they're looking for cash Christmas gifts to provide pro bono care at Pearsall. But the announcement is they are creating a volunteer position for human rights learning project. They're going to be doing um, workshops in the high schools. So they're looking for volunteer teachers. Um, he is so fast. But anyway, he just got that up there. I have sheets with more information. If you want more information, just see me and I'll give it to you. Thank you. So look at that, right? So we had 19 minutes and we did that and 12. Yay. Do you have another card for it? Right, 90 seconds. Come on up. Come on up. I'd like to ask uh, regarding work issues, uh, you'd think that slavery was totally out of the question here in San Antonio. I would like to ask Gloria to please stand up. Gloria, por favor, te pones de pie. She is a human trafficking uh, uh, rescue uh, in the north side of town in a gated community. So uh, just to let you know, we all need to step it up. Okay? Thank you so much. Being here, Rebecca. Gloria. Sorry. So I'm going to hand this back to Lena. I think this is when we are able to do networking. You've seen people's faces. Anyone is interested in this kind of part of it, but the action team of the Faith Based Initiative were meeting by the piano. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. Yes. I just want to thank Anne Helmke and her office, the Faith Based Initiative. <laughs> because they have made IWC the recipient of their donation drive for December. And we are going to have, um, from what I understand from Christopher? Um, Patrick. Uh, Patrick, thank you. Yeah, the, the donation of multiple donations of diapers and medicines. And the last time they did this, we, we increased our, our store by about um, 100%. So thank you for that. I realized we have one minute, and I had two more things. I, uh, Mary Grace left me a list, a whole list of all I'm supposed to do while she's gone. And one thing was to tell you to you know consider housing one of these uh, Peace Corps um, Peace Corps uh, singers. So think about that. The second thing she wanted me to let you know is that we are looking for a space that is close to the airport where we can uh, store our backpack supplies. So it'll be more convenient for our volunteers. So if you have a church or some space that you think would be great, let me know because we are looking for that space. Thank you. And thank you all for being here. Uh, I'm so proud of our uh, leadership team and all the work they're doing. And I think you probably are too after hearing me. So thank you for being here. Um, we'll see you in January. And uh, God's blessings to all of you. Thank you. Thank you.